So I have named this recap Cosmic Construction because that's what we're going to, to cover. We're going to recap how God put the universe together. We've taken about 15 weeks to discuss all of this. We did Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and then we broke from the Genesis narratives to go through celestial assumptions, just what the ancient authors would have understood about the celestial world in broad terms, hierarchically. That looked like this. Yahweh's at the top, but he uses a divine council. His uh, highest ranking celestial family members are called the sons of God, oftentimes the divine council. They have other names, but we'll stick with those two. Then we saw the cherubim and the seraphim are the guardians of God, and then the angels are just mere messengers for these higher ranking beings. But you see Yahweh up on top because he is their creator, he is their king. This was the assumption of the ancients about how the celestial world was put together. And that this was in play before the terrestrial world came along. The physical universe came along and God basically added to the hierarchy. Underneath angels, and it'll be hard to see if you're watching online, but that's very same structure here. Added in, you get beneath angels. And this is basically Psalm 8. If you look at Psalm 8, you can see a little lower than the Elohim. And we talked about what the Elohim mean. All of these beings are Elohims. You get humanity. Mankind, male and female, then under male and female, humanity rules over the animals and the lands and stuff. So there's hierarchy to everything. It shouldn't surprise us that people in our lives have authority over us. God designed authority as part of the created order. Let's talk about why. You find this in uh, the creation stories of Genesis 1 and 2. And just in broad strokes, what are these stories about? Genesis 1, 1 through chapter 2, verse 3, the seven days of creation, is the story of chaos being transformed into a temple for God and his imagers to live in. Then, starting in chapter 2, verse 4, and going down to the end of chapter 2, the garden is God's holy of holies within the temple. You have the temple is, is the entire building or construct, the, the specific room of the Holy of Holies inside the temple is the room that God's presence dwelt in with the ark. And they're, they're writing Genesis 1 and 2 very late. Now, the stories were probably around in oral form for some while before they wrote them down. Um, but the, the versions that we have are relatively late. They're, they're just laced with all sorts of allusions to Babylon because it's, it's probably happening during or right after exile. Uh, in Babylon, in like, you know, five, th think around 600 to 500 BC, just a ballpark here. They're writing this down, and they're they're reflecting back, and they're, they're trying to picture the cosmos, the universe, that the, the physical world that humans experience as a temple in chapter 1. And then in chapter 2, the temple within the temple, the very place where God's presence dwells, is pictured as the garden, the holy of holies. And then God brings his image bearers into this place and says, now go out from here into the chaos and continue turning chaos uh, into the ordered garden picture uh, for the rest, uh, until the rest of creation is there. And we talk about the fact that these stories are not scientific. We cannot read our modern expectations back into the text. Before scientific language took root, most language was phenomenological. This was a Jeopardy question last week. Um, I missed that one. Describe the, the phenomenological language is language that describes the way things look to the human eye. That's all. The sun is not a god who uh, rises technically and doesn't set, but it looks like the sun rises and sets. It looks like it moves across the sky. It was only about six, uh, 400 years ago in the 1600s that we started looking at things through this different lens. So this is the language of the Bible, including the, the story of in Genesis 1. Let me just read uh, what's, what's written in this paragraph here for, for the sake of continuity, because I think this explains it well. This was just a simple Google search for the term phenomenological language. Phenomenological language. Much of the Bible comes to us with language that describes the way things appear to the naked eye. The language used 
is descriptive of the way things look from our perspective and not necessarily ascribing precise scientific fact. Example of the description of the sun rising. Unless we understand the use of phenomenological language, we will think that the Bible teaches that the earth is the center of the universe. When we realize the Bible describes things according to appearance, we see that the Bible is not really saying the sun revolves around the earth. Rather, it is merely saying the sun rises because to our naked eye, it looks like the sun moves and the earth does not. This use of language is still current. The meteorologist gives us the time of sunset, but nobody assumes he is teaching that the sun revolves around the earth. So if you can separate the ideas that God did not demand people learn scientific truth in order to communicate, you can read the scriptures better. He let people describe things the way that they experience them and the way that they conceive of things. And so when they conceive of things as a temple, creation gets described as a temple. When, when they're thinking in terms of a holy of holies, they describe the garden as a holy of holies. They describe Adam as a priest. So, Genesis 1 is the story of God turning darkness and chaos into light and ordered existence. God creates order out of chaos by speaking across six days to order the universe. So what matters and why does it matter? Well, in our modern expectations is that physical matter is what matters. And we think that the story is telling us how God created the physical universe. So we naturally read Genesis 1 as if it's meant to tell us where the physical matter came from, answering our own scientific questions developed within the last 400 years. This is our starting point, so we assume it's the same starting point of the authors, but it wasn't. The biblical authors don't care where physical matter came from. Nobody cared where physical matter came from in the ancient world. To them, it's just there. So what is there in Genesis 1, 1 and 2? Just formless, empty existence. But the, what we would call physical matter is already there. It doesn't deny that God created it. It just applies creation as a term to who gives form and function to physical matter. So it's a slightly different emphasis. We can't impose our expectations back 2,000 years on the writer without missing the point they want, us to, uh, they want to make in their own stories. They seek different truth differently than we do today. They're not worried about where the physical material came from. All ancient Near Eastern writers, including the Hebrews, had a different set of presuppositions when it came to what creation was and why it mattered. What would an ancient Near Eastern Hebrew consider important about creation if not the physical material? There are three ancient Near Eastern ideas to be understood before we even would jump into Genesis 1, which we're not going to do today. Creation of physical matter is irrelevant to the story of Genesis. Creation of form and function is what matters most. Genesis 1 does not answer questions about the universe's origin. Why are we here is the question that's being answered. Genesis is not telling you how, do you, got, how you got here. Genesis is telling you why you were put here. You were put here to guard and to keep the garden. You threw it away. We all do. It's telling you your purpose. And most people really don't care, well, how exactly did I gestate my mother's womb and come to be? Most people do not care what physical process got them into existence. They're born already. They take it for granted. We take it for granted. But we ask ourselves, why exactly am I here at all? And that's actually the story, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, uh, and all ancient Near Eastern creation stories were trying to explain to their readers. Number two, when God begins creating, the cosmos already existed, but it was useless. It served no function. It could not support life. It was nothing but pure chaos. The Joker would have loved it. So the Joker could not have existed because it took form and function for the Joker to come into being, right? Uh, someone needs to create order out of chaos, and that's what you see happening across the six days of creation. And number three, we won't go too much into this this morning, and all other ancient Near Eastern stories of creation, the gods fight for domination, and the victor gets to establish the world as he sees fit to it. You remember what I said last week, what is necessary for all story to exist? In one word, started with a C, ended with an onclick. Climate, wait, no. Conflict. <laughs> Conflict. Conflict is necessary for all stories to take place. 
In Genesis 1, the conflict is not between God and other gods. And, and he doesn't defeat other gods and then decide to create. That's typically what you'll see in the Enuma Elish and the Babylonian creation story read at New Year's. In the Baal cycle in Ugarit. Um, you know, most uh, ancient Near Eastern creation stories, the gods fight and the victor becomes the head god and then he orders the universe and he puts the gods in their place and then he puts the physical universe in, in its place and then something else happens that we'll get to in a moment. You don't see that happening in Genesis. God just steps in, sees disorder and death and chaos and stuff reigning and so he creates order and out of order life. And so Genesis 1, the first two verses, is just the setting of the story. We talked about this last week because this was a Jeopardy question. Um, the first verse of the Bible is a mirrorism. It, it takes two extremes, heaven and earth, and implies everything in between. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth is a statement that says everything that exists was created by God. That's all the first verse of the Bible means. And then step, step uh, verse 2 comes in and you get this, this other idea. Here's the state of things when God began to create. Everything was formless and empty. Hebrew, tohu vavohu. Nope, you can feel that rolling off your tongue. It's, it's two words in Hebrew, tohu vavohu. Formless and empty, void of life. It had no purpose, no order. The deep, uh, it was just watery chaos. Primordial chaos is a picture of a terrible state of being. Humans can't live on the water. Humans can't live in primordial chaos. So God stepped in and did something. So you see in verse 2, God's presence is surveying the situation before acting, and then we get a structure to the rest of the story. Day 1, day 2, day 3, day 4, day 5, day 6, and then day 7. You can break these seven days of creation into three groups. Group 1, days 1, 2, and 3. God pushes back the chaos to create realms of order. Day two, uh, sorry, group two, days four, five, and six, God fills the created realms of order with living creatures. And then day seven, God sits down to rule creation. So group one, days one through three, three realms of order. On day one, he creates the order of time. He says, let there be light, because there was already darkness. And he separates light from darkness. And we should read this as a span of light and span of darkness. Because he calls the, the span of light day. And he calls the span of darkness night. And so what he's really creating there is a span of time. Day two, he's, he takes the primordial waters and he separates them. He leaves water below and he creates the heavens above. And they, they consider the heavens above to be a physical vaulted dome. That's what they understood it to be, because it has to be solid, because there's water up there. The water falls down. And so there's a dome up there, and it's holding back the primordial waters. But humans can live underneath the dome. We'll talk more about that. We'll come back to that when we get to Noah in Genesis 6 uh, through 9. So the weather patterns are, are essentially what's created on day two. The realm of the weather. Uh, the future creations are going to live underneath this dome. They're going to live within this time span of day and night. This is all heading somewhere. And then out of the waters that are left below, he creates the order of the land, the earth. And then he fills the earth with vegetation. So two things on day three. The earth is brought up, and then the uh, vegetation, the plant life, comes there. And then we get to group two, days four through six. Living creatures to fill the realm. Day four, the sun, the moon, and the stars govern the realm of time. Why do they consider these living creatures? Because they move. Exactly. Very good, Logan. You may keep your man bun another day. Yeah. Every time you answer a question, I will let you keep your man bun a little bit longer. Uh, Fail to answer it, we will chop off your man bun. Oh. Yes, they think phenomenologically here. They are standing on the earth, and the sun moves, and the moon is not always in that part of the sky when I'm looking at it, and I could have sworn those grouping of stars were over there six months ago. So they look like they move, so they consider them living creatures. Ultimately, most of these cultures are going to consider them gods. Day five, the fish fill the sea, the birds of the sky, so the waters above and the waters, waters above and waters below get filled with living creatures. Birds and fish, and then day six, just like day three, the last day of both groupings gets two things. 
the first thing on day six is the animals. But then a much higher, greater thing gets made. Image bearers of God. Humans. So the six previous days of creation can be broken into these two groups. Group one, the realms of order. Group two, filling the realms of living creatures. Uh, and day six is the climax of all the created things. Why? How do you know this if you're reading? Because of poetry. The narrative breaks for a poetic statement, the first poetic statement in the Bible. Let us make man in our image. 126. And so God made man in his image. In the image of God, he made male and female. He made them. Poetry stops the narrative. It means slow down and pay attention to this because this is important. And you can see that really easily in our English Bibles because they often, and you know, when you're reading prose, it just goes straight to the end of the page and everything like a newspaper. But when they get to, to poetry, they'll divide it up. It'll be bracketed off oftentimes, and it'll, it'll just physically look different to your eyes. You'll know you're reading a poetic point. Slow down and pay attention to those types of texts when they break from the narrative because they're trying to tell you something very important. So it's like a Disney character who breaks into song. The song in a Disney musical is going to tell you an important point. And it's meant to capture an idea in more than just words. And music and melody, it sticks with you. This is designed to stick with you. Uh, to emphasize in oral communication, humans are better than everything that God has done up to this point because they bear God's image. This uh, is the climax of the created thing, but there's still uh, something greater to happen on day seven that we'll come back to in just, just a moment. So let's break this down and summarize a bit of what it means to be an image bearer. So in verse 26, he said he's talking in plurality now. Who's the us in verse 26? This is why we did part of the celestial assumptions. God's non-physical celestial family are present at creation, yet they do nothing but observe. God says, let us make it. And we talked about this. The sons of God often gather around God's throne, and then they sit there and do nothing because God already says what he's going to do. And sometimes, like creation, he does it all by himself. So nobody helped God, and certainly nobody helped God make humanity. What is the image of God? Also a, a Jeopardy question from last week. A gifted status over creation. Let them rule over the birds of the sea and, and the fish of the waters and, and all that stuff. Uh, all humanity possesses God's image like a mirror that reflects what shines on it. We're meant to shine and reflect God's rule over the physical world. Uh, just as the us do over the non-physical world. So he's already built, let me just go back to this page here. He's already built this in the celestial realm. Now he's adding order to, to the universe in a physical terrestrial realm. And just like he wants his, his non-physical image bearers to rule with his power in that non-physical universe, he now creates physical image bearers to rule over his physical universe. God doesn't hoard power. He gives it away. He gives away responsibility and tasks. We're created last in order, but we're the greatest in rank. So he's starting from the bottom, and now we're here. To quote that one rapper. You know? uh, he's starting with primordial chaos, and then he lastly creates his image bearer. And he says, all of this that I've made, step for step, was designed for you to be your home a place for you and me to live and dwell in together. So humanity is the climax of God's created beings. Man is God's image. They have the gifted status to rule the created order under God and his celestial family. They have authority over us too. They just don't get to always emphasize it except at specific times throughout the Bible. So the poetic statement emphasizes the importance of this creation in relation to all else that came before all humans possess inherent value because they have the status of image bearers. They are worthy of dignity and respect beyond that of any animal and other physical creations like the moon and the star. This means that your animal is not your child. I know you have an emotional attachment to it, but it is not the same thing as having an actual child. It's good to take responsibility for your animals, but when you have children, 
you have actual children. You see what people are doing these days out on social media. They collect animals. They're like, I'm a cat mom or I'm a dog mom or something. It's like, that's, that's not bad. But if you have actual children, you're, you're stepping up to a higher goal because the humans are higher than your animals. Take responsibility. Don't advocate responsibility saying, I'll take care of these animals, but I won't take care of humans. Humans are greater. And it's not just men. And it's not just women. Male and female together create the image of God. We are both image bearers, and we both uh, genders, both sexes, make the image of God complete. Uh, and, and so we see this picture from the Naked Bible, uh, Naked Bible um, the Bible Project uh, stuff that we use. The six days of creation up on the top left, and then humans are rulers over all the realms. Uh, it, within the realms, they're rulers over all the creations. And so we came to this little picture here, this little doodle. Uh, if you were looking at just the terrestrial realm, you could see humans at the top, the living creatures in the middle, and then the physical, non-living, non-sentient creations at the bottom. But all of this is not even the greatest thing because there's still one day left in creation. Day seven, God rests, God sabbaths. And this is the, the text that most people skip over because they're idiots. They, they want to read the story as it having to do with physical existence, and the creation of physical life and physical matter. So they have no idea what to do when it comes to reading the story of the Sabbath. It's only three quick verses. The, Sabbath, the Hebrew word Sabbath means rest. God is not a physical being, so he has no need for physical rest. All of God's celestial family has no need for physical rest. So what is his rest about? This is what I just said. Most people who read Genesis 1 as a story of God creating physical matter have no clue how to understand day 7. The ancients, thankfully, knew exactly how to understand it. And if you understand temple building, you understand what the seventh day is about. Gods and goddesses rested in their temples when it was finished being built. A temple was a home for a god. In the ancient Near East, there was often a general order of events. The gods fight. One god defeats another, gains some level of power over all the other gods. That god would then order the world as he wished, then have a temple built for themselves. When the temple home was finished being created, the image of that god or goddess was placed within that temple. This was de described as the God taking up rest in his temple home, or what I call rest residence. Instead of residence, they rest in the, the temple. And at this point, the God's reign over the territory would begin. So we see God's rest in and over creation as being the point of the story of Genesis 1 and the first three verses of chapter 2. The story of God designing the world to be like a temple, and then he sits down to indwell that temple on the Sabbath. His glory fills the creation of the world. It's a theological climax in day seven. And you're not, if you're reading days one through six as physical, you're not reading it theological. Because you'll come to day seven, and you're like, I don't know what this is about. That's because you need to read the other days as sequentially, theologically, climaxing, not even in the creation of the image bearers, so that is a certain climax. But in the climax uh, of God sitting down to rule as king, God is the ruling king who turned the formless chaos into a living cosmic temple to rule over everything, and he willingly shares that ruling authority with humanity. So God's rest for creation means that we take time off and we rest physically. He has no physical need for rest, so what's the point of creating a day of rest for his physical beings? Why is this one of the Ten Commandments, the one we ignore? Once every creation cycle of seven days, we conclude the week by resting from our work in order to express trust in God as the real ruler of the created creation we experience. We cease from work. We cease from exercising our power and authority for a 24-hour time span to show that we trust that he did, in fact, sit down to rule the world. It acknowledges his rule beyond our own human efforts. So yes, you have authority, but there are limits to that authority. And you are expressing and recognizing a limit to your own authority. If you can't let go for 24 hours on Saturday and relax and not work, you have no real trust in God. You have 
no faith. Because everything comes down to your own human effort. The, the thinking goes that if you were just dealing with the first six days, it would be this picture. But when you get to day seven, you get the point that it's this. God is king, and he sits down to rule creation. Ta-da! So we come back to this, and we see, boom, God at the top, and all of creation is in order together, from heaven to earth, from the celestial down to the terrestrial. And that's the story of Genesis 1, and the assumptions of the celestial world behind it. Any questions thus far with that? That's just a summary. Don't ever let anybody tell you, and this has just been an aside, don't ever let anybody tell you that we don't keep the Sabbath. Now, we can talk all day long about what that means, but if you actually read Genesis 1 correctly, you'll understand that God put it, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Six days you shall do work, and, and on the seventh day you shall do no work, neither you nor your slaves nor your animal. He built it in for all of creation uh, as something different and when you miss the story, a lot of people just don't know what to make of the Sabbath, so they ignore the very commandment of God. And the thinking goes, well, it's the, it's the only one of the Ten Commandments that's not repeated in the New Testament, so we don't have to keep it. That is a load of crap and a terrible way to read the Scriptures. And people will do this in modern Protestant churches with the best of intention because they start from a faulty beginning. They read the Genesis creation story wrong all about physical matter instead of the theological point that God is king it's his temple and he fills and dwells it and he rules over the territory of the land so, so rest Sabbath at the end of the week take Saturdays off and do nothing and express trust in God do your homework Sunday through Friday but do your best to, to, to be able to rest on Saturdays and not do anything you don't necessarily have to do that's considered work. Have some fun. Relax. Play your video games on Saturday. But don't play them every other day. Right? No, I, I'm, okay, I'm just trying to help you here. So, let's just go through as quickly as we can Genesis 2. We call, I call this God, God's in Garden. We saw that in Genesis 2, uh, starting in verse 4, we go from the big picture of creation down to the micro, the small picture of human life with God in Eden. Genesis 1 is God's kingship over all creation. He gives it all form and function. Genesis 2 is going to focus on the relationship of Yahweh and humans. God plants a garden as his own home on earth. Remember, we talked about this. The, the garden was not a, a home for man. It was a home for God. God was going to live and dwell there and meet with humanity there. Humanity was going to have to come and go in and out of the garden, but ultimately get banished for good. It is God's capital in his new kingdom. Humans are allowed to live with him in this garden, but they need to leave it to fulfill their work, their, their commission. And their commission is twofold, serve and guard, work and keep. In Hebrew, it's abed and shamar. Uh, which is either Abed, to work or to serve the needs of the garden, and to Shamar, God, or keep or guard the garden space. And so, Adam is portrayed as a priestly figure, because these are terms for priests. Priests keep and, and, and serve in the temple, in the tabernacle. They keep and guard sacred space from contamination. Sacred space is just space where God dwells on earth. It's a place not everybody can go, unless you're clean enough to go. Humans have already been given kingly status as rulers and authority in Genesis 1. Now they're given priest-king status. Eden is the first holy of holies. That's what the story is about. So, we understand from this parallel story in Genesis 2 that not everything was perfect in order from the start. God only planted trees and gardens from a specific place called Eden. He starts by planting in a specific location and leaves the rest of the world uncultivated. So even Genesis 2 is commenting on Genesis 1 and saying you shouldn't read that as, as God setting up a perfect physical universe. You should read it as God sitting down to rule as king and God. Uh, because the physical universe isn't perfect. There's disorder. 
and chaos, but there's also order. The man is expected to extend the borders of Eden, where, where order and God's reign is, and he needs to extend it throughout the whole world. Uh, you must take responsibility as an image bearer, and you must push back chaos and disorder. You must create order, because where order is, God reigns as king. So clean your rooms. Keep them organized. Let's take responsibility and let's keep this room clean and not make it a mess. But you're allowed to eat in here. But, uh, you know, last week where we're used to sitting, there's some crumbs and stuff on the floor there. There's some trash left there. And it became a little bit disorganized. Push back the disorder. Put your food in the trash. Keep things clean as a mark that you're actually trying to extend sacred space and Eden extension as the goal. And you see here, Eden is, is starting in Genesis 2 as the smallest. And there's still chaos out there in the world. And there's disorder now in the middle. But we're actually supposed to extend Eden. And to do this, God made us in his image, which means three things that I call the three F factors. And this applies to all humans everywhere. You have freedom, you have function, and you have physical form. It's an F. It's a Latin name. All right, whatever, freedom. Whatever the man called the animals, that was its name. So Adam's first task, organize the animals. Give them names, create some order out of the chaos, because they're all just kind of there in the garden. God brings them to the man, he names them, orders them, and gives them function and purpose. The woman's not even around yet, but she shares in all of this stuff, because she will name Cain and Abel. She will name the children. She will express the same authority over them that Adam expresses over the animals and that God expresses in chapter 1 when he creates a thing and then names it. And he doesn't step in and say, no, I don't like that name, call it this. God is, is someone who gives away power and leaves it gone until it has to be taken back when death enters the world. And that's called judgment. Okay, so you have freedom. You also have functionality. You're supposed to rule. That's also a part of naming the animals. Organization, a form of creation itself. And to do this, you have male and females together, extending the image of God and multiplying it out. The second poetic statement in Scripture, bone of my bone, this now is, is, is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, for she come out of man. In this second poetic statement, Adam expresses this emotional state when he sees Eve. It, it, it's excitement and joy because he's passed, or had all the animals pass in front of him and he sees, okay, they all have four legs. That centipede thing over there has like 80. Uh, those birds have two and a bunch of wings. None of these creatures are like me. And then he takes a nap and he wakes up to a naked woman, best nap ever. This, this is why, you're, uh, you, you know, men always fall asleep in the middle of the day. They're hoping to fall asleep and wake up to, to their naked wives, right? They're just replicating Adam's problems, or, uh, his, his faith, and resting before God, before sin entered the world. That's why we nap as men. I think that's just you, Chuck. Oh, no. Uh, the trick, all dads do this, right? But, but the, the statement is like, yes, finally! Huzzah! Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Something that's like me. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. A human. Someone who's 100% human like himself. However, she can't be called man. She has to have a different name because she's 100% human and 100% not a man. And recapturing this idea and this theology is what's going to actually stop this transgressive movement in our culture that says a boy can be a woman if he wants to be. A woman is just a person who identifies as a woman. I'm like That's not circular reasoning. A woman is a woman who identifies as a woman. Is a woman who identifies as a woman. A woman is a woman who identifies as a woman is a woman who identifies as a woman. It's just circular reasoning. It doesn't go anywhere because it's not actually true. And in, in the Bible, you are one or you are the other. Um, there are two physical genders, and, and they come together, and they make new image bearers. And so this expresses a metaphysical reality about God. God is not male or female. Male and female together make up the image of God in its fullest form. They rule together. Men and women are, are ontologically equal. By nature, you are no better off being a man than you are being a woman before God. 
However, that's your vertical relationship with God. In your relationship to each other, it's not quite equal in function. Humans may be equal in nature, but they are subordinate in, in all ty types of uh, functions and roles in society. Wives are, are meant to be subordinate to their husbands. Kids are meant to be subordinate to their parents. Employees are meant to be subordinate to their bosses. Civilians to public authority figures. All of us are supposed to be uh, uh, submissive to cops, to firefighters, to, to the politicians who technically have some power, even though they're probably idiots. No. These functional relationships are built to, to, to be a certain extent malleable. You know, just because you're a dude over here, you five guys, does not mean you get to disrespect your mother because she's a woman. Honoring the fact that she's an image bearer means you listen to her and do what she says. And it works in reverse. Just because you're girls doesn't mean that you get to disrespect your father. It, 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 it's meant to be interlinking and changes all the time depending on situations and circumstances. So all community relationships and functions are built off God's fundamental societal institution of marriage that we see in Genesis 2. He made them male and female and he gave them this relationship to bind them together. But it is based on distinct physical forms that create gender roles because sex has gender roles attached to it. God's physical blessing on heterosexual sex is the fact that when they come together, they can actually create new, new image bearers. And that's how he blessed humanity to make new image bearers. It is the, but it is the embodying, it is, it is the physical embodying of gender roles. You're a little young to appreciate this, but you men don't play the same roles in sex as you ladies do, or will, when you're married. And that's purposeful. So why should it surprise us that out there beyond just the bedroom, we, we actually have and express gender roles? Mothers carry the children, both before and to an extent after they're born, until they're weaned. And fathers play a guarding and serving role when the women are physically incapacitated due to pregnancy and need someone to actually take care of them. We step up and take care of them. And it's not a, 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 a rest of your life kind of thing because eventually the marriage uh, progresses, the child is born, and, it, and eventually the baby that needs caring, that can be split to a, to a degree between women and men but it's predominantly women because they're still tied to your physical form even after birth. But eventually the child grows up and is capable of doing more on its own. And you can either have another baby and replicate the cycle or you can move on to something else. You don't have to spend your entire life uh, raising and bearing children. In fact, you can't. God puts a time limit on it called menopause. Uh, and, and so let's, let's summarize all of this here where we're at. A lot of people think of heaven above and earth below on this photo as being separate. But the way that we're supposed to view the story of Genesis 1 and 2 is that there's overlap between them. The place of overlap where God and humanity meets in the Holy of Holies of creation in these stories was Eden, the garden mountain of God. And God sits his throne there. And rules there, but he looks down at humans and he says, come, come be with me here in this place. Adam is created outside the garden, but God brings him into it and gives him purpose and function to guard and to keep the garden. So humans reach out and they say, yeah, let's, let's sit down and take the gift of God's authority and power and rule with him, under him, alongside him, pick a preposition, but let's take up some responsibility here and be God's image bearers and make the garden grow. See how it's barren here and here the humans come in and they make it grow up and stuff? That's intentional as far as these pictures are concerned. And they're doing it together. Right up until the moment another creature comes along and offers them the chance to do it without God tears the universe apart because a celestial being and these two terrestrial beings are now going to rebel. A 
against God and try to rule without God's power. They're going to try to do better on their own, and they're going to fail. And the world is going to be split apart, and relationships are going to be torn because of this primary problem that we're going to see starting next week. What is the fundamental problem with the universe? God is not allowed to rule unchallenged. We started challenging him in the garden, and we've been challenging him ever since. We have to learn to stop challenging him and let him be the king that he set down to be on day seven. And submit to his lordship again to put the universe right. 